Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we finally complete another episode of our RimWorld Extreme Desert Challenge. Yes, it has been a little quiet around the channel for the last few days. Some of that had to do with the launch of our Mass Effect 3 series, which if you haven't watched it yet, feel free to check it out. But being pretty busy at my other job at the university also played into it. In any case, today we're back, and it's going to be an exciting episode to say the least. Now, last time we left off after defending the steakhouse against a mechanoid raid, during which Stake unfortunately lost his leg, but luckily we were able to craft and attach a bionic replacement rather quickly. Near the end of the episode, we also cleared out the last remaining ancient danger on the map. That one wasn't too threatening, though. Now, to start us off today, we are first being visited by an Imperial trade caravan, and this one actually includes a relative of Troy, although we really won't be able to do much with that information. Having just finished a small limestone sculpture, this one showing Carl making a sculpture of his own, Stake can now install that to continue our hydroponics farm beautification project before he then meets with the caravan. The exchange is rather uneventful though, as we're only going to sell some flake, which means up next we can quickly talk about Alistair and his minigun. I know that in the last episode I said that miniguns have a forced miss radius, however, that is technically no longer correct. Nonetheless, they are still a pretty inaccurate weapon, even in the hands of a talented shooter. And not only that, they are also so heavy that they slow down any colonist who's carrying one. For that reason, since we're not in any immediate danger, we will have Alistair switch back over to a heavy SMG for the time being, but the time will undoubtedly come where he will pick this weapon back up. Now, we also have a bit of a food issue going on in the steakhouse at the moment, and that is mainly due to a bit of mismanagement on my part. It looks like our hydroponics farm is not quite delivering the output to keep all eight colonists fed, so for the moment we have to dig into our supply of packaged survival meals, which is of course not the best long-term solution. Before we start growing more rice though, let us first increase our cotton production, which coincidentally also includes removing the solar panels here, which then in turn makes this area a little nicer to look at, as we have finally managed to get it up to a neutral beauty rating. On the next morning then, we are investing a bit more into our defenses. We have plenty of steel to spare, so I think we can afford to construct a few deadfall traps, and placing those directly in front of our turrets should help their longevity. And those defenses will also be desperately needed, as we are now accepting the paid violence quest that we received last episode. In exchange for 10 more honor for stake, we will have to defend the steakhouse against two groups of traps people, both of which will arrive in roughly four days, one shortly after the other. But if we get our defenses up and running until that point, I don't think this is going to be too much of a problem. Around noon then, we have cargo pods arrive, including a few fine meals, and a little later, all men in the steakhouse are blessed by a psychic soothe, and the latest rice harvest has also brought back some meals, at least for the time being, so things are looking pretty good at the moment. However, the clock is ticking, so we will have to continue constructing our defenses. And very importantly, we do of course need power, and quite a lot of it, which is why we are installing a switch here to be able to turn all of these turrets on and off with one easy flick. In the late afternoon, we can then once again marvel at Redhawk's harvesting speed, as our colonists are of course not the only ones requiring some food, and a healthy supply of kibble ensures that our hauling animals can keep doing their job. On the next morning then, Redhawk continues working the fields. Our defenses are also slowly but steadily coming along, and honestly, that is about the most exciting thing that happens today. Sometimes you just have to spend a day getting stuff done. And with that, another evening and then another night quickly passes by. And on the next morning, we are once again briefly using the moisture pump to just get rid of three small tiles of soft sand, which are currently blocking the expansion of our rice farm. As soon as that's done and we have moved over the wall, it is then time to construct three new hydroponics basins, which doesn't seem like much, but might be just enough. With the crash of a steel meteorite, our lucky streak then continues, even though it has come down at the far edge of the map. 
and things keep going well as Steak now receives a recruitment inspiration, which means his next attempt to recruit a prisoner is guaranteed to succeed. Now, I'm not quite sure if we'll make use of that, at the moment the 8 people that we have might do just fine, but if someone intriguing comes along then we have options, and again the clock is ticking, we are about to get attacked pretty soon. At this point we can also take note of the fact that two of our three new Labradors, Tyler and Whiskey, have learned how to haul, while Boone is in the last stages of finishing her training, but she should join her siblings very soon. And so, with a bit more dog power helping out, the day keeps going, our defenses keep coming along, and in the evening we already have a respectable number of turrets up and running. On the following morning then, the Psychic Sooth comes to an end, hopefully not marking a turnaround point, but at least for the next few hours, things remain fairly uneventful. Chopping up some of the bugs we killed last episode, Troy is now making kibble, while the majority of our colonists keep working on our defenses. A little later, Troy then also finds another underground steel deposit, and once again it is fairly close to our base, so as soon as the current one is depleted we will move on straight to there. Taking another look at our defenses, we have now more or less closed off the area. The only things still missing are a few more traps and turrets, but at least in the turrets case we have a small reserve in the form of our old kill box, which I think we can now take apart. As you can see, this allows us to very quickly fill in the new one, and just in time, as the steakhouse is once again coming under attack. And no, this is not the attack that is part of the quest we just accepted, however, that quest will likely trigger very soon as well, which makes the timing of this attack pretty inconvenient. To add to our worries, we are also facing a 35 person siege, so it's not like our enemies will be running straight into our kill box. That means priority number one is to man the mortars and hopefully land a few shots before they can fire theirs. With this large of a crowd we should hopefully be able to do a bit of damage that way. In the meantime the rest of our colony is getting dressed for combat as the first shot lands right in the middle of our enemies, but at least for the moment they do not seem to be too worried. Now the next shot went wide, but number 3 here actually destroys one of the enemy's mortars while it's still being built. That of course makes things a little less dangerous, but still our attackers stick to their plan. Now I had anticipated that, which is why we are now sending Edmo over there to annoy them a bit. Just in that moment though, the enemy's mortar fires for the first time, and they are using incendiary shells, setting fire to our biofuel refinery. Now luckily they did not hit our supply of chem fuel, nonetheless we do of course want to put out the fire immediately. In the meantime, Edmo, who has equipped a sniper rifle, has made it into range of the enemy camp, so he can now start firing and hopefully do a bit more reliable damage that way, and with a bit of luck, that or another mortar shell will cause our enemies to finally abandon their position. Alright, so just as our enemies get off another shot, we land one of our own, and that is enough to prompt the full-on assault. For Edmo, that means it's high time to get out of here, his bionic legs should carry him fast enough to make the use of the jetpacks not necessary. The enemy mortar shell, meanwhile, lands a little close to one of our power conduits, and for this next part of the fight we definitely do not want to lose the connection to one of our geothermal generators, so while the rest of our colonists are already getting in position, Jake can quickly put out the flames. We are then eagerly awaiting the arrival of our enemies inside of our small shooting gallery here, and as you can see the sandbags are working exactly as intended, funneling our foes inside one after the other. We are also using Troy to launch a few EMP grenades here, as some of our enemies have shields equipped, and Alistair has of course gone back to the minigun. And while we are able to kill a few of our enemies, we are not really able to decimate their numbers, which is obviously also not the main purpose of this, so as soon as we have Pollyanna here catch her first injury, I think it's time to retreat. 
Thanks to the second row of sandbags, it will now take our enemies a good amount of time until they get into the next area. Time that we can actually use to quickly patch up Pollyanna's wounds, because unfortunately she has suffered a bit more than just a scratch. By the way, as you can see, Carl did also get hurt. I have put him into a melee roll at the moment with a thrombohorn and a shield, but perhaps foolishly so without any sort of actual armor. Still, he has only suffered a small bruise, while Redhawk now also gets hurt. Nonetheless, we have gotten ourselves a few kills here, and with that we have certainly taken some pressure off of our turrets. Still, I would say it's time we make our way out of here and now leave things to our turrets. So far, we have not suffered any major injuries, and I would like to keep it that way. Unfortunately though, RimWorld can sometimes be a cruel experience, because just in that moment, exactly four days after we have accepted the quest, we are once again getting attacked. And not only that, the tribes people here, who actually include Jake's sister, they will be trying to dig through our defenses, so we can't just use the same approach as before. To make matters even worse, they are arriving in three separate groups from three separate directions, so it looks like our already thin numbers will be spread even thinner. Unfortunately, that also means that we have no other choice really but to put all of our trust in our turrets, which thankfully pays off rather quickly, as you can see here. This actually also opens the path for an interesting development, because it looks like the fleeing attackers are running headfirst into one of the groups of tribespeople. That means we should hopefully have a bit of time to assemble the remaining healthy fighters on the eastern side of the base, from where we are facing the smallest group of enemies, which we should hopefully be able to take care of quickly thanks to superior firepower. A carefully timed Berserk, one of Stake's new psychic abilities, at least stops the digger from digging, although they do not turn on their allies and instead we quickly take them down. Still, it does look like we should be able to fend these guys off without too much trouble. And indeed, group 1 of 3 is retreating, the enemies from the north meanwhile seem to have been caught in a bit of a skirmish, so far they have not actually entered our base yet. That still leaves the largest group who are coming in from the south and who are now our next target, as it appears the other group is in fact running into our kill box, and these are tribes people who should not stand a chance in that case. Down south meanwhile our defenses have been breached, but good news, group number two is now also fleeing, and with Stake, Jake, Edmo and Alistair, and most importantly with the liberal use of Stake's burden ability to slow down our enemies, we can hopefully finish this fight. Okay, and just as the last enemy falls and the final group starts to flee, Jake suffers a mental break. Understandable, since none of our colonists did get much sleep last night. And timing-wise, probably the best possible moment, as we now have at least a small break in the action. And we are using that break to quickly strip off this woman's silver plate armor. That's simply too valuable to just leave it here. We can also see one of the reasons for Jake's mental break here, his sister was sadly among the enemy casualties. And only a few seconds later the trouble continues. The second group of tribes people arrives and once again their goal is to dig into our base, and also once again they are sending three groups at once. Now we can hopefully do some good damage against the group from the north with Edmo and Alistair in combination with our remaining turrets, luckily we didn't lose that many. We are also using Carl here to arrest Jake to get him to snap out of his mental break and yes, Pollyanna and Redhawk are also leaving the hospital. For this fight, I am afraid we're going to need every gun that we can get. As the shooting starts up north, we can immediately release Jake again and have both him and Carl remain near the prison, just in case our enemies change their minds. Meanwhile, down south, we are using one of Stake's royal permits to call in a trooper squad that's heading straight for the slightly smaller group that's coming in on the left side here. 
While we keep those enemies busy, the group up north has had enough of our turrets and is now starting to attack our base itself. Luckily, we kept Jake and Carl around for exactly that purpose, and Edmo and Alistair are also quick on the scene to help out. In the meantime, the trooper squad successfully drives back the first group coming in from the south, but the fight is far from over, as another larger group is about to breach our perimeter now. On the other side of the base, the combined manpower of our defenders forces the second group of attackers to retreat, and so we can now focus all of our attention on that last wave of enemies. Red Hawk is unfortunately getting caught in the crossfire a bit here, but also thanks to that trooper squad we called in, it looks like we have the advantage here. Yes, this is probably the bloodiest fight that the steakhouse had to endure so far, but with reinforcements now arriving as well, I am cautiously optimistic that we are going to emerge victorious. And indeed, despite half of the colony injured, we stand tall in the end, thanks to our recently constructed defenses, the last-minute help of our Imperial friends, and of course, some solid tactics. All in all, pausing the game and thinking about ways to win these three fights probably took me a good two hours. In the end though, our efforts are rewarded, and our colonists can finally get some rest now. Injury-wise, we luckily don't have anything permanent to report, Poliana arguably took the most damage with a gunshot wound and some damage from a recurve bow, while Alistair suffered a cut and a crack, and Carl got off easy with just a small bruise. Redhawk actually took two gunshots, but again no one lost any limbs or received any additional scars, so I think at the end of the day we can very much live with those results. And just in case you're wondering, yes, Dake did receive those 10 points of honor. We never received a notification, but he is now only 8 points away from reaching that final rank of count. And so, with our heroes changing back into more comfortable clothing and already repairing some of the damage around the base, an eventful day slowly comes to a close. Redhawk and Carl are the first to make a full recovery, while Pollyanna and Alistair will need a bit more time. In the middle of the night, we then receive another quest, the Heart Prisoner, although I am not quite sure if we're going to take this. In order to receive one of the three rewards here, which are admittedly quite interesting, we need to house a blood rot infected prisoner for 15 days. No trouble so far, our hospital is well equipped for that. Defending the base against 9 centipedes, 2 lances and 3 pikemen, however, well, let's just say I am a little less confident about our chances here. Luckily though, we won't have to make a decision too quickly, so as usual, feel free to let me know in the comments what you think about this one. Just a few moments later, a pair of visitors pass by, and on the next morning, shortly after Alistair is back up on his feet and fully healthy again, we take a look at their wares. Or rather, they take a look at ours, as we have just acquired a bunch of stuff we have no use for, and can even grab a few more components here, while still taking all of their money. Our food situation, by the way, does seem to be solved for the time being. It appears those three additional basins were just enough to keep everyone fed. And so the day continues, rather unsurprisingly I think, with some hauling and repair work. Luckily, we did not suffer too much structural damage. As the evening rolls around, Pollyanna is then the last one to make a full recovery, at least physically. Mentally, both Pollyanna and in particular the recently imprisoned Jake are not happy at all. At least in Pollyanna's case though, that changes on the next morning. Yes, it looks like Edmo has come to regret his decision from a few episodes back, as for the second time in this series, him and Pollyanna become romantically intertwined. Now, we'll have to see how long their relationship lasts this time. In any case, a double bed is still in place, so we don't have to take care of anything else to accommodate the two. This also gives us a good opportunity to check out the relationships of everyone else in the colony, starting with Edmo himself. Apart from his love for Pollyanna, and apparently also still for Redhawk, he seems to be good friends with Troy, while Jake is very much disliked. I think the two of them did even get into a fight or two recently. Redhawk, meanwhile, is an easy case. She seems to get along just fine with everyone, and that feeling is very much mutual. The same is true for Troy, and yes, I still occasionally forget that he is actually related to Pollyanna. Jake, on the other hand, is an interesting case. 
His body purist trait has him despise everyone with artificial body parts, and the effects of that can be seen here very clearly. Pollyanna is much more easy to get along with, it seems, unless you're named Jake, of course. Same picture for Carl, he likes everyone except for Jake. Alistair then actually has some sympathy to spare for Jake, but he doesn't like Carl, and finally Colony Founder Stake gets along with everyone, just like a good leader should. Speaking of leadership, to celebrate the recent victory, to congratulate the more or less new couple, and to perhaps raise everyone's mood a bit, Stay can now give another throne speech. He is more than likely to say a few fitting words after all. While the steakhouse is listening intently, another set of cargo pods drops down, this time containing wolf skin, which we can certainly use. Also, Stake's words are indeed inspiring, as Poliana enters a shoot frenzy at the end of the speech. For the next eight days, she will now have a much improved aim. And with another day winding down, we can take one last look at our kill box, now almost fully equipped with turrets. Just a few seconds later then, Labrador Noosa once again gives birth, and once again she is having triplets, but I think these three will be sold, we don't need to go overboard with the animals. And so, another night sets across the desert, and I think we have reached a good point to make the cuts. Don't forget to let me know what you think about that quest we received, and before we wrap things up, we also have one more piece of fan art to show off. Once again, Ada Lynn came through with this rendition of Stake's accident in the last episode. I imagine he looked a little bit more thankful after his bionic replacement was installed. And I think that's it for today, so as always, if you enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, feel free to subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.